We were just talking about the situation uh, in the Tory party, particularly around Lee Anderson. Well, I've got to say, um, you might be familiar with the fact that Paul Scully, the MP, yesterday he was saying um, about there being so much, well, two in particular, no go zones. I hate saying that sentence with my accent. Yes, I know. I sound ridiculous when I say it. Anyway, he was basically uh, saying that these two uh, no go zones, now today, he's basically come back and apologised for saying that the areas in question was fired. Uh, in Birmingham and Tower Hamlets in London. I've got to say, though, as someone uh, that's not backwards in coming forward, Swella Braveman, she uh, has done an interview with the podcast Trigonometry. It goes live tomorrow night. We've got a preview of that, and I just wanted to play you a little clip of it. Let's listen. I think the pace of migration is causing real damage to community cohesion and the social fabric of our country because people are coming from countries where their culture is sometimes at odds with British values and British culture. And I think we are seeing that play out in a very worrying way on our streets, but this is only going to get worse in years to come. What do you mean by that, Suella? You've just made that comment. I think I know what you mean, but what do you actually mean by that? I mean that if you, you know, if you look at uh, if you take a, a, a hard, honest look at our country, uh, we have towns and cities around the United Kingdom where multiculturalism has failed, where communities are living parallel lives, where people come here and they don't speak the language, where they come here and they don't want to take part in British life, they don't want to integrate. And in fact, they, they actively loathe uh, what Britain stands for. And they are in Britain, but not of Britain. Mm. Well, that, uh, as I said, was trigonometry. That's interview premieres tomorrow night at seven o'clock. I mean, she's not mincing her words there. Did you agree what Sweller had to say? Uh, my first concern with um, immigration is, I think, simply leaving aside the question of cultural um, assimilation, if you like, um, is simply the question of numbers. I mean, over a million people in the last year came to live in this country. Um, uh, that was netted off against something like 400,000 who left. So you get left with a net figure of about 600,000 people. I mean, there are whole questions about how those, how people are accommodated, what, what the housing is that provides for them, the public services, the meds, the medical facilities, and all the other things that go with that. And I think that is a pace of numbers that is simply too high and too fast for any country of this size. But to assimilate. Do your party then, have the political will to put a cap or restrict those numbers? Well, I'm going to ask. I have a question next week in the House of Lords that's been timetabled for next week, asking them to comment on the ONS projection of uh, population growth over the next 10 years. Well, we look forward and to I'd that. I'd like to know what their policy is. I look is. forward to that. they agree with the projections or they're going to do something to stop it? Well, the reason I ask um, is because Suella Bremen carried on uh, this conversation. She had something to, spe to say specifically uh, about the volume of immigration. Just listen Listen to this bit too. And for my part, I've been very um, eager to deliver on that policy to lower net migration. And technically, it's very easy to do, actually, from a home office or government point of view. You don't need to pass a law. You don't need to worry about human rights or the court in Strasbourg. You don't need to um, get any new votes on it. You actually just have to take an administrative an executive decision to, to do it. And I had the hope that I would be able to do that. And unfortunately, I was met with a lot of resistance from around the cabinet table. And um, the prime minister, you know, didn't want to engage in this subject and didn't want to uh, deliver on it. You'd have to ask him. Well, you see, I think that's quite damning, actually. So there you go. So well, the leader of your party, of course, our broader prime minister, apparently, as well as saying there's resistance right from him, right from his level to uh, controlling immigration. I think this is partly because there's a Treasury mindset and an Office of Budget Responsibility mindset that says the more immigration you have, the faster the country grows. That's the country as a whole might grow. Of course, there's a separate question about whether individual wealth is getting better. But the more it grows, and therefore you can, you, it, it addresses public finance problems, and you can get on and do things, and it makes life easier for the Chancellor. This is without considering 
the other area that I haven't mentioned, which is the social, con the social context of immigration. Well, we'll come back to that one. I just want to bring Judita in. Uh, your thoughts. Either you can pick whichever one of those ones you want, because we're going to cover both, so start with whichever you want. Um, I think the question... I'm going to start with the question of immigration. There's always this um, rhetoric that's put out that England, the Britain is a small island, you're going to be submerged under the numbers of immigrants. All, the key is about integration. The pr approach a government has to integrating those that come can always bolster an economy if you do it effectively. But when you have rhetoric that's coming from, and the kind of language and discourse that's being engaged in and fueled by Suella Braverman, when you constantly other communities and make them feel that way, they will react accordingly. All you have to do is look through history. How did things like the mafia begin? Italian and Irish immigrants were made to feel so other and so deprived. They did what was necessary to survive within their community and provide for just their own. So then when you get that byproduct of behaviour you began, you cannot complain that it exists because you haven't provided a remedy. So are you saying she's wrong? I'm saying that her appro the issue does exist 100%. Her approach to handling it is the wrong one because it's only going to spur on more problems that fracture and splinter off into creating more ills within society. So she's actually part of the problem, not the solution. But she, many of my viewers would say, she's actually just been direct. It's quite refreshing to hear someone call it out. They live among communities where there is no integration. Uh, people perhaps don't speak the language. They don't, um, they're not as one, like she says in the interview, they live parallel lives and they would argue that their communities are changing not for the better because of this uncontrolled immigration. And they would applaud someone being direct finally about it. Would you... Am I feeling from the you that what you would rather is that she almost kind of, like, pussyfoots around the issue? Not or? at all. Not at all. Call it out because it is an issue. But the way you've been handling the, it thus far is what has caused it to be the kind of issue it is. There's How do you call it out nicely, then? No, speak to it and say that I believe that these kind, this kind of infrastructure should be put into place that forces immigrants to integrate and assimilate to a community so you don't feel so othered. And you can't be... How have do you a... force someone to integrate? OK, for instance, let's... OK, there's a film that's just come out... At, by Ken Loach called The Old Oak. Watch it. And you see the steps that go through where um, the Syrian immigrants come in. They're made to feel like, why are you here? Because you're coming into a deprived community that doesn't have much of their own. But over conversation and discourse, they're integrated where you help each other and you improve the society. It's all about knowing what is missing, what is needed, who can provide, and how do I provide access for those new people to fill in the gaps which aren't being filled currently. That's how you bolster the economy. So let's talk about this uh, social cohesion uh, side of it then. Do you agree uh, with what you've just been hearing, Daniel? Well, actually, I think Judith should actually focus on, you know, she talks about Suella Braverman's approach. Okay? Suella, Suella Braverman has just said in front of us that her approach, what she would actually do, let's not keep talking about language, mm -hmm. what she would actually do is take the administrative decisions, which she says are easy, I don't know whether that's right or wrong, take the administrative decisions that would reduce net migration substantially. Now, the real question is, I think at the moment, talking about Suella Braverman, is do we agree that that is the right thing to do and stop talking about the language of the whole thing? That's what people want to focus on. Um, now, there is a separate question about of those people who have arrived, and not necessarily recently, because we know there are communities in, in Britain which have been long established which, which actually live, you know, have uh, territorial areas in parts of some of our cities that are basically, that, that is where they live and where quite frequently some members, older members of the community, still don't speak English, although they might have been here many years. Um, so we know this is not, this is a problem and we know it's not necessarily just to do with recent immigrants. There are questions you could ask about how you can integrate them and how you can stimulate that in, in, uh, integration and encourage it. But the key question Suella raises is, should you actually take the administrative steps to reduce net migration dramatically? And do you I think, think she should? I think we've got no choice about it. This is a key, key, key question. What are those administrative steps and why does your own party's leader dis disagree Well, I've already explained them? why I think the uh, Conservative Party, um, I've given my view on why I think the, can, the leadership of the government um, hasn't adopted those steps, and I think it's to do because of a, a, a particular understanding of their financial uh, and economic consequences and the, consequ the fiscal consequences. And I think that is a, a poor interpretation based on bad modelling. That's my view. Um, but, but, but the administrative steps are relatively straightforward because you stop issuing visas, you put salary requirements up so that you don't allow people below certain salaries to come in. There are various administrative steps you can adopt that don't require new laws, as she says, because they're already, the powers already exist under existing law. 
for the government to do those things. Me, so you can take that how approach. I, how I counter that again is what I said before about speaking to lived experience, because what you're talking about is a very idealistic perspective, because the kinds of immigrants you're saying where you put a cap on earning potential and so on, it wipes out a rudimentary amount of people who feel forced to migrate because they don't have the luxury of those meeting those quotas and meeting those barriers. Yeah. But when you actually have them in this country, they end up, when through a, unbelievable hurdles, they end up occupying all the jobs that indigenous populations in Britain do not want to do. And when you go to an airport, when you see the person cleaning the toilet at a hospital, somebody doing ungodly hours on a farm, they're doing it happily because with foreign exchange rates, they're probably sending it back to their families. So they're doing, and it's happened during COVID, we saw, some, saw so many channels covering it, where they gave jobs to British, young British people who said, I just don't like the hours, yeah, they didn't turn sorry, up, but they I, will do it. So, so, so the people you don't so want you to let in so have the potential to we, contribute we to the country in a way that is of labor in certain areas. But if all we do is carry on with the model, where our economic model as a country is that wherever there's a, a job that's doing, we import somebody on low wages to do it. Um, and, and, and we don't actually address ourselves to the capital investment that might be needed in those areas which can be automated. And there are lots of them that can be automated. I'm not saying cleaning toilets in, in hospitals is one of them. But there are lots of them that can be automated. And we don't force businesses to do that investment. And we constantly turn on the taps of cheap labour. Then where, is, where do you think we're going to go? We need an economic transformation in this country. We need improved productivity. Instead of having improved productivity, all we do is say, oh, you can't get cheap labour. We'll provide you with some cheap labour. OK, do you, then, do you have a plan that you plan to put forward to change the mentality of the society to then occupy and do all the things that those they immigrants are happy to do? They don't do all those things. No, lots of those things can be, lots of those things can be automated and, uh, through investment. I mean, I've just done, as the House of Lords, we've just done a report on modular construction for house building. We still build houses in the the same way we did in the 18th century, 200 years ago. But there's a huge amount you can do to, to automate, to, mod to, 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 to factoryize, if that's the right word, the production of houses. We know all of that. It's not happening because the house builders like the idea of cheap labor and, and they're used to the old methods. You take the cheap labor away, they'd be forced to automate. So, but then doesn't automation open the door to you eradicating jobs and therefore damaging yeah, Of course the it workforce? does, but what? But, the, but, the, but then what, just saying what you, the jobs, we can only fill the jobs by importing no, people on cheap it's wages. About to provide, no, no, it's about fundamentally providing for people. Automation opens the door to eradicating opportunities for people. So automation yeah. might be the way forward right. and might be very functional. But my, my discourse is always about what is in the best interest of people. People function, coexist to create yeah, society. the best interest of people is that we have more productivity in the economy. Everybody agrees on that. One way of doing that is automating.